You're listening to SM Media, the number one place for exclusive content. Hi everyone and welcome to the latest episode of the Scottish Football Show right here on SM Media. I'm Scott McPay, delighted to be your host as always. We've been a long time since we're on, obviously, with a few circumstances that's prevented us from being on the, the show in the past couple of weeks together, but we're delighted to have two-thirds of the full team. Wilson's here. Wilson, how are we? Fine, thanks, Scott. It has been a while, but a lot's happened in uh, international football as well as Scottish football, so I'm looking forward to um, getting down to the nitty gritty and uh, getting back on after Rangers draw last week at Hearts, we cancelled the show, um, but we're back now and they get three points a day, so great to be back. We're also joined as well by Rory, sorry, is it BBC's Rory Loy or just Rory Loy? What are we going with? <laughs> just, just, just Rory Loy's fine for me. <laughs> at the <laughs> moment. <laughs> How are we, well? Yes, all good. I'm looking forward to the show. We bit bunged up with a head cold, but all good. And we'll get through the games as quickly as possible. We're going to obviously, but since we've last been on, there's obviously been a lot that's been happening. Well, so we'll just go, obviously we're not going to get through every game in the past three weeks, but we'll ask you a couple of takeaways since you were last on the show. What's going to caught your eye in the Scottish football scene since you were last on the show? Um, what's caught my eye was the two international results, obviously for Scotland, Steve Clark. Um, again, regardless of performance, um, and the Pharaohs, it's three points. Don't really care how we get the three points. We got them. The Israel game was unbelievable. I mean, I've been going to Scotland games most of my life. And, you know, the atmosphere was absolutely electric. Even, you know, when we were down, you know, 2-1 and things, it was still, the place was absolutely wasn't Hamden was rocking. So that was great as well. Positive result, results in Europe as well for the old firm. Taking that away as well. And uh, the other thing I was just going to note, and we'll probably talk about it later on, was the... Hearts has has their kind of champions uh, or one in the league kind of faltered. That's two draws out of two. I know going to Ibrox obviously very tough. Um, and St Johnston maybe proving me right after all these years <laughs> as well. The last two results. So the uh, last few weeks has been really good in terms of football and Champions League. It's been it's been great. Rory, what's kind of caught your eye since we last on the show? Certainly Scotland. Um, it's I, I think it's nice going into the the two fixtures going. Performances don't matter. I think so long for so long as a nation, we've been looking at Scotland going, we need to see evidence of performances coming through. So it was quite nice to go into the two fixtures going, it doesn't matter how we win, just win. And, you know, that performance in years gone by, say we hadn't qualified, or we, we weren't left with a chance of qualifying. You know, it would have been a terrible performance in the Pharaohs, but it was very much job done. Can't wait for Moldova. So I think it was good. It's a good headspace to be in as a Scotland fan going into the next group of games. You know, beat Moldova, you've got second place guarantee that's shown up and it's and it's and it's good. Um, and there's obviously been a lot of league action um since then. Um and some interesting results. Celtic's starting to build a little bit of momentum, a little bit of form um on a more consistent basis. And Rangers um scraping through at times and getting the job done. So be interesting to talk about it all this evening. Yeah, we're going to look through the games that took place this weekend. Also, we'll start with the Premiership. We'll just get through the results quickly. Hearts won, Dundee won, Aberdeen won, Hibs nil, the D United 2, Motherwell 1, Celtic 2, St Johnson 0, Ross County 2, Livingston 3, and today St Mirren 1, Rangers 2. We'll start off at Time Castle. Hearts went top of the league yesterday for well, 24 hours until Rangers went top of the league today. Rory, you were at the game. Would you say it was more a case of Hearts ruined missed chances and Dundee making inspired substitutions and that's kind of what got Dundee the point. What was your overall thoughts in the game? No, I definitely don't think it was missed chances per se for Hearts. I know the highlights package you could, you, you know, make, looks like they hit the bar, Gary Mackay Stevens hit the post. But Dundee had chances of their own. Um, I thought over the piece a draw was fair. Hearts are always going to dominate possession at times in the match. Um Obviously, it's a wonder wolf from John Sutter, who's some of his passing. Don't get me wrong, he was a little bit loose in possession at times, but his actual range of passing was, was actually a joy to be there and see. I didn't realise, I don't think, just how good he was at his distribution. And not not just his execution of his passes, but his awareness to see or popping the ball into striker stuff you would be looking for from a central midfield player. I and mean, when Hart squeezed Dundee back and got up the pitch, he was almost playing as a central midfielder. He was he was excellent. Um 
But I thought Dundee were good for their point. Hearts were probably wasteful is the is the word I would use. That you know they got into the final third many times. Mackay, um, Smith on one side and Cochrane um on the other. And like I said, very wasteful in the final third. Couldn't pick a man out, hit the first man a lot of the time. Um, wayward crosses, wayward efforts. Yeah, it looked good up until that point. But like I said, Danny Mackay Stephen should probably score to make it 2-0 right at the start of the second half. But over the piece, I I, I genuinely think Dundee were worth a point and I thought I'd, I'd always probably fared. I was a bit disappointed in Hearts. I thought they lacked... You know, I, I said before the game that it's fine blowing teams away 3-4-0 and four nil at Tynecastle. But see that time you don't turn up or you're not quite free-flowing, you need to find a way to win. Um, and as Wilson quite rightly says, you know... <laughs> stuttering and things it's weekends like that are going to kill hearts that draw against Dundee that chance from Mackay Stephen you know you see Rangers today they get the job done you see Celtic yesterday they just get the job done I appreciate Rangers and Celtic have both drop points but as the season wears on I think these types of results will just kill hearts momentum and they'll fall away at some point I still think they'll finish in the top four but I still don't think they're going to be I just think the festive period and going into the new year you'll probably see a gap starting to emerge between Rangers, Celtic and Hearts and Dundee United. Wilson, what was your overall thoughts in the, the game? Hearts obviously taking the league through a, a wonder goal, as Rory says, for John Souter. Jason Cummins come on and got an equaliser. Was that, do you kind of think it was a surprising result when you saw it? It was a surprising result. I think it was certainly what you'd call a coupon buster for your 10 homes or whatever. Um, but again, Rory's right in what he says about the analysis. I'm, I'm watching sports scene. Rory's here for the 90 minutes. I'm watching sports scene. It looked as if heart, hearts were wasteful. Hearts should have won, etc. The only point I would ask Rory, and again, I, I watched the highlights, but I didn't I kind of video search the analysis as um, Michael Stewart was on it. So um, I video searched it a wee bit. Um, can, can Craig Gordon have came for the Dundee goal, Rory? I, I, I'm just always a great believer in it's, it's a long throw from the six shard box. Can Craig Gordon not come out and, and claim that? Not that I'm wanting to criticise goalkeepers right enough, especially of Craig Gordon's stature, but I thought I looked in the telly. I think he came, maybe have came and got it because it was a bit kind of comedy. I, I seen, I heard uh, Emilumo, Chris Emilumo say on Sports Scene that he felt the keeper should do better and Michael Stewart didn't he wholeheartedly agree but said that he probably had a point. I would have to say no. I, I think it's it's schoolboy defending from Beningame. I mean, Jason yeah. Jason Jason Cummins doesn't. He, I, but he doesn't do anything. You know, you're not looking at that going. Ah, well, you know, he's he's went kind of checked away to come short, or he's done anything spectacular to to get that yard of space. Beningame just simply lets him run. I think it's a difficult one for Craig Gordon to come out and get, especially with Jason Cummins moving at pace. I, I think you're extremely disappointed from Gary Craig Gordon's point of view that your defence has not dealt with it. I think even in training, if your man's running off of you that easy, you're getting a rocket up your ass for your teammates, um, never mind on a match day. Um, so I don't I don't necessarily agree with that. I, I don't think he could have. Just on one note, though, I thought Ben Woodburn at the time, I was at the opposite stand, and at the time, I thought it could have been a red card. And looking back on it now, I've seen it on sports, you know, there's no doubt in my mind, I think that's a red card. Um, so that could have swung the game. But to answer your question, no, I, I personally wouldn't place any blame in Craig Gordon for that goal. In, in touching on the Ben Woodburn thing, um, I, I, I can't believe the linesman is standing about three inches from them and he waits till the referee blows his whistle and then puts his flag up and waves as if he should be what, in there what, separating what I, that, doing his, doing his job straight away. What I don't understand is the fact that if he can give him a yellow card, it means he's seen it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, see, see if he goes, right, I, I didn't see it, I'll give the foul or, you know, play on, then you're going, well, he didn't see it. But to give the yellow card, he's obviously seen it. So if you've seen it, then how can it not be a red card? And the, and the line is you know. one yard from it, and the fourth official is probably about 20 yards from it. You know, I, I found that was a bit, that, that Ben would have had a couple of chances early on, kind of snapshots and that. He looked busy and things. Again, it's from the highlights package, but I, I, Hearts will definitely see that as two points dropped the home game against Dundee. Yeah. Yep. We'll move on to Petodre. A big result for Aberdeen, a 1-0-1 over Hibs. They end a 10-match winless run. Christian Ramirez with a goal. Wilson... We spoke a lot about Aberdeen in a negative fashion in this show in the, to, at the start of the season. That is a massive three points for Stephen Glass. It is so, and especially with games against the uh, Rangers and Hearts coming up. Um, you know, all of a sudden it's a massive three points. And again, actually, actually, I was actually going to put on our chat earlier. I watched the interview with Stephen Glass. Stephen Glass looked a bit kind of kind of aloof now 
as if, you know, they kind of turned the corner and all that. And I mean, his interview is very, I mean, I know he's been very kind of hard to interview as such. Um, he's been quite nippy with the journalists and the reporters and things, but I actually feel he came across quite aloof a wee bit as if, you know, that has us turned the corner, etc. He's going to go to Ibrox and Wednesday night and get beat 6 nothing, you know, and then it's going to be back to this um, all defensive mode all we had. Uh, 28% possession in three corners, we should have won the game kind of scenario that their chairman was coming out with. Nonsense. As I say, a big three points, but I don't see them taking the end from the next two games, so um, they're going to be back to square one for me in the next week or so. Rory, do you think that is a turning point for Aberdeen? It's difficult. It's difficult to say whether it's a turning point. It's, it's too early to say that. Um, what it can be is a catalyst to, you know, to go to Ibrox Similar to what I said about Dundee, Dundee beat Aberdeen the previous week. And I think it then gives Dundee license to go to Tynecastle and be a little bit more open. If they're taking care of business at Dens Park, they can then go to Tynecastle and go, do you know what? We're not reliant on these three points. We didn't earmark three points, so let's go and be a little bit more expansive because we I think Aberdeen are the same. Had they been beaten by Hibs on Saturday, they're going to Ibrox and, and, and they're going to need to try and get something for the game. Whereas now they can possibly be more risk than reward. However, I just feel like it's difficult to say whether it's a turning point. And as Wilson rightly says there, you know, Stephen Glass needs, and he will understand that it's not, I think it was just relief. If, you, if you're asking me in that interview that they finally won and he was able to answer questions in a positive manner. But, you know, there's been a lot of chat about data and stats and stats can be used positively and they can be used to, to analyse a game and they can be used constructively within a changing room. Possession is is a difficult one for me unless the game is nil nil, and it's an e on, on an even keel for ninety minutes. Then you could potentially look at possession and say this and that. I think if a team's going two nil up after twenty minutes, after sixty minutes, and making a decision to be passive and give up possession, to then at the ninetieth minute go well, you know we dominated possession, we should have won the game, we should have taken some for, for the game. I didn't really buy into what Dave Cormack was saying. I didn't really. You know, having been at the game, we had seven shots. Adam Legends put his hat on at least six of them. Um, but with Christian Ramirez, they put somebody that can score. Yeah. So I just think yesterday it was a case of how much do you want to keep a clean sheet? And I include Ramirez in that for the front. How much do you want to dig in and make sure we don't concede a goal? Because we've got a guy at the top end of the pitch that can score. So we can get one, then we've got a chance of winning the game if we keep a clean sheet. And that's how it transpired. So um, I think they'll go to Ibrox. I don't think it'll beat six. Um, but I fancy Rangers to win that match. However, Rangers have been playing too well themselves lately. Um, but from what I've seen of Aberdeen the week before, I didn't see anywhere near enough to suggest that one result means they've turned a corner. Well, touching Hibs, obviously, that's their third defeat in a row in the league. Is that a potential slump, Wilson? Obviously, I know it's early days to say that, and they obviously started the season well, but it's no great. Obviously, they didn't look, I think, like really getting much out of the game yesterday at any point. No, I've, I've been critical of Hibs in the past um, on here that when it comes to big games, you know, they, 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 don't, they don't seem to do particularly well. And as I say, I sometimes just think with, with Hibs, if you can nullify Martin Boyle, who seems to be their kind of main player, um, then they don't seem to create much. I see they've got good individuals, they've got big, strong players, but as I say, I, I think Hibs are maybe showing possibly where they should be in the league. I know I tipped them at the start of the season. I thought Nisbet would have been on fire this season. Always, you know, think players that maybe I know he was kind of a, a move didn't happen last uh, kind of January when he put in a transfer request. I always think, you know, right, I, I definitely want to leave Hibs. I've made my mind up. I'm going to score or try and score 20 goals this year. I know it's not a lot down to him and have a wee bit about him, but if, if especially Boyle and him, if they're not firing, then I, I don't see where Hibs' threat's going to come from. I think Jamie Murphy's kind of in and out the team. Obviously, he's, he's a wee bit older now, he struggles with injuries. Um, Joe Newell started the season really well and then has, has faded away, you know. So, uh, as a wee bit of a worry for Hibs, I don't, I don't know who they play midweek. I want to check the, the fixtures. So you got the Celtic. Well, there you go. That could be five each. It could be five not Hibs or five not Celtic. No, no one knows what's happening these days. But it's not, it's not a game you really want to be going into after losing three in the three in the bounce. To be honest, Rory, who would you say about Hibs? Well, there's ear, Wilson's ear about 21 goals already for Wednesday night, so I'm hoping he's right we get a goal fest. Um, <laughs> what was that, Pikey? What was my thoughts on Hibs? Yeah, Hibs, do you think there is corner cause for concern after their kind of recent slump? No, no, and the reason I say that is because their manager, I, I obviously hold Jack Ross in extremely high regard, having worked with him, and 
you know, I just think he's always got a good reputation and, and he's coaching and the way he'll remain calm. But the last two weeks will have hurt him. Um, I think as well, there's probably a little bit in him going. I think he was once the up and coming coach who everyone was talking about. Um, he was the next kind of thing in terms of management and coaching. I think it would have hurt him a little bit to lose to Tam Courts so convincingly. Um, I think that would have maybe hurt him a little bit. And I know how he works. He likes to get his block of games and earmark points. He likes to ask the players and the group of players, right, as a collective, how many points are we going to get over the next? But he'll in his head as well have earmarked, you know, in his own in his own mind without, you know, saying it outwardly what he thinks. And he definitely would have earmarked three points at home to Dundee United. Um, so to lose that and then, you know, going up to Pataudry where you're, Obviously, Aberdeen's form hasn't been great. Maybe you're marking a point or three to get none out of six. It'll have, like I said, it'll have hurt him. Um, but he's one of these guys that, you know, I was I worked up on him for six months. He lost his he lost his rag once, and quite rightly so. He's very calm. He's very measured, and he looks at things from a constructive point of view. And he's very constructive with his criticism. So I'm sure that he will remain calm. Um, and and I think they will turn a corner. I've no concerns about Hibbs. I do agree with what Wilson says. I think that Boyle. They probably are too reliant on Boyle. Scott Allen, you know, flits in and out the game. He looks nice on the eye, but how much does he actually affect the game out with the, the highlights that you're seeing on the telly? Um, and um, Nisbet has not really been firing in terms of in terms of goals. So I um, I know there was a bit of concern amongst the Aberdeen fans when 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 he went to three at the back um, and the team was announced. And I think on the left they had um, somebody had he played there so often. So I know there was a bit of concern about Boyle, but you know. Um, I think they kept him quiet and, and and ended up winning the game. But I think Hibs will be absolutely fine. Um, I, I would still have concerns over Aberdeen over the next few weeks. But I, I do think Hibs will be OK. I'm not saying they're going to go and beat Celtic on Wednesday, but I think they will be OK. Well, you touched on Thomas Courts earlier. And obviously, the day right at the start of the season, I was one. I think Wilson as well with them not doing very well. But what a start of the season they've made. They're obviously levelling points for Hearts in second. Rory, I'll come to you. What have you made of the United so far and how big are players like Ryan Edwards and Charlie McGrew obviously scoring yesterday? Well, Charlie McGrew has been phenomenal any time I've seen him. Um, I mean, one centre-half, you know, tricky winger up the wing, whipping it in with his weaker foot to his other centre-half who nods it in at the back stick. I mean, I watched the highlights I was thinking, what's going on here? <laughs> um, but I think it's very difficult. Obviously, I was the same. I was quite sceptical of I think it's a totally different, forget football, forget tactics, forget anything. I think it's a totally different dynamic going from youth team, working with youth team players to working with professional men. I think that is a huge change in itself. Never mind. And when the, the proverbial hits the fan, if it does go through a tough period and he's got, you know, and he's got <coughs> experienced players knocking on his door, I think that's when we'll maybe see a little bit more about Tam Courts. But for now, you know, he's, he's doing really well and, I was sceptical, I say, look as well, but it's very hard to judge an unknown quantity. Nobody knew anything about the guy, so very difficult to sit and make judgments before anyone's kicked the ball. But look, we all love to do that, and that's why we're here to do it. So um, I think we were all a little bit worried about Dundee United, but Charlie McGrew's been, has been sensational, and you know they've got um, no lack of talent up front as well. Nicky Clark's scoring a few goals and, and looking good. And um, I, they've got, is it Nick, Nick Asson or someone in the middle of the pitch Nickerson, who's doing I, really, yeah. Nickerson, who's doing really yeah. well as well? So I think how I would describe Dundee United at the moment is they're riding the crest of a wave. Um, I do think we'll go through a period where they might struggle. And I think that top six, although they started really well when they're sitting joint top of the league, or they were before today, I think that top six is a realistic, achievable, and a, would be a very good season if, if they managed to do that. Wilson, what was your overall thoughts in the, in the game yesterday? Did the United do <laughs> Motherwell one? I think what Rory touched on there earlier was a catalyst. I think that's what Dundee United did after they beat Rangers at Tandice. They were on a good a good wee run. I think prior to that, there would probably been some team meetings, dressing room uh, discussions, and then they've kind of turned a wee bit of a corner and they've, they have performed well. Um, Peter Paul, I think, has been really good for them in the middle of the park as well. And as, as Rory said, Charlie Mulgrew has obviously been a great signing um, at the back and at the other end of the pitch. So again, I think Rory's right. You know, top top six is probably probably their aim. But again, I, I was always think for a team that you maybe win your home games, and that's that's what that's what they seem to be doing, picking up wins at home. I think that's them beat um, Motherwell Rangers, and uh, the I think they lost the cup. 
They beat Hibs at home. They lost well. the cup to Hibs at home. Is that right? They won, they won the derby at Tannadice as well. And they, and they, yeah. I saw, got a point at Parkhead as, as well. A, as a gay, I think, I think we were probably thinking at the start when we said they might struggle was we never heard that the manager, you know, going from, again, as Rory says, youth players to senior players can always be difficult. But fair play to what he's achieved so far. He's achieving a lot more than what experienced managers at this stage of the season. So good luck to them. We'll move into Celtic Park. Celtic 2, St. Johnson now. Giacu Marcus scored in his first start for Celtic and Juranovic made it two with a penalty. Wilson, Celtic finally look as if they're getting a bit settled. They've got a team there that's, pro- that's probably yesterday the best team they could put out. They look a lot more settled. They're, they're thriving. They're going on a good run. Obviously, two big away wins against Aberdeen and Muddle and then a win yesterday. It's, it's, it's looking upwards for Celtic, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah, results wise, certainly. Um, obviously, tied in between all those games was the the, the game against Ferris Varos. Um, so yeah, it's, it seems to be going okay. I, I I just think with Celtic and Rangers, I think they will suffer a wee bit of burnout with the volume of games that they're having to play. Um, and a good few of the players also are when they go international, they're playing. As well, you know, Celtic have guys from nearly every European country, Japan, Rogic was in Australia, etc. I, I think all these things will catch up because I think the games are coming thick and fast. Um, but yeah, I think I think Celtic fans at the moment have got to enjoy it. It's funny how you know, four weeks in a row, Ange Ball's the greatest invention in the world, then for four weeks, Ange Ball's the worst uh, for their tactics or formation in the world, and now it's back to being all, all as well again. But that's just how fickle we all are. Um, but I, I think the, the boy up front that scored yesterday looked busy, certainly looked a better bet than Ajeti. And it's obviously a better cover for Kyogo um, if he gets injured or whatever. Um, but yeah, a, a good result. As I say, St. Johnson are struggling a wee bit. You know, losing at home 3 0 to Longison would, that would upset the Stuart dressing room, never mind the St. Johnson dressing room. Um, so, but three, again, three points each, each game as it comes. I watched Poster Cogwell's interview yesterday. And, it's what it's one game at a time for him, but as I say, going to Fur Park and going to Petodre and winning is, is is good. But let's just see if there's a bit of consistency there in the next three or four games. Do you think Wilson? What what do you think is our strongest front three? Given that if Giamakis plays, obviously they rested um, Abada yesterday to get Giamakis in and put Furahashi out the right. What do you think our strongest front three is? Given yeah, that they would need to move Furahashi no, out to the right. Think- I think it's got to be Jota, Kyogo and Abada. I think that at the moment's possible the front three. But that, that, this is where we've kind of, well, I've, I've uh, looked at and of ridiculed Celtic for the uh, depth of squad. I wonder, you know, now if injuries are clear not, James Forrest must be due back kind of soon. And as I said at the start, I think if Celtic can stay between, you know, four and six points behind, I, I don't think this board's scared to spend some money in January. You know, if they start, to, I still, I, I genuinely still think they need a back four. You know, as much as Ralston, etc., have have done okay, I think if Celtic need to go to the next level, you know, then it needs a better back four than that for me. And I think Celtic fans, are, and I know social media probably shouldn't read it, especially mine. If anyone that's tuned in reads mine, um, what what one week staff felt's the worst signing since Martin Hayes, then next week he's real Ferdinand. You know, and as I say, I always think what you've got to take into account is the opposition. You know, you're looking at today, for example, nobody really shouldn't talk about the Premiership in England, but you're looking at uh, England's, you know, centre half at £90 million was absolutely embarrassed today. £50 million for Luke Shaw, England's left back, scored in the European Championship final, absolutely ripped to bits today. And I think sometimes Celtic are given at large when they beat St. Johnson at home, you know, but I think there needs to be bigger fish to fry for that team to get any sort of acceptance and progression. I, I just, I think that back four, it's it's okay. It's okay against St. Johnson, Livingston, Ross County, but I still think they need four new players in there if they want to beat Rangers, get in front of Rangers and do anything in Europe. See, um been interested in your take on this as well, Wilson, because... I see a lot of talk about how when Julian comes back and Hugh Heal helps Starfield out and whatever else. Do you think that Christopher Julian's reputation has been enhanced more when he's actually not been playing than when he does play? Because I think that, I don't know, everyone seems to think that when Julian comes back and gets up to speed, that he's going to be this kind of almost the saviour of a defender who comes in and dominates the back four. It's not, you'll know better than me, but he's not, I don't remember him being, you know, the most dominant 
defender in the world, the best defender in the world. I feel like he's, his, his reputation is actually enhanced because of how, how poor Celtic have been defensively yeah. since he's been out. I don't think it's actually that he was that good when he played. No, I mean, I would, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, <clears throat> I think, obviously, when he was in before in, in Celtic, were well, very dominant at the time in leagues and cups. And then he's part of the winning team, so you develop a wee bit of a swagger. Um, but as you say, when he's, when he's out, you know, I, I remember him getting bullied. Morales bullied him at times in old firm games because he couldn't physically compete against them. And Julian was six foot four, and Morales is five foot two. He's bullying him about the place. Hanker Dykes it, as well. Dykes got a very good... Dykes as well. Absolutely ragdolled him. And I, I just think, we, as you say, I think the performances of the defence, oh, well, Julian still would come back. It's maybe a wee bit like James Forrest as well. Now, James Forrest certainly has proved he's a good player. Uh, I just think there's a, bit of a, there's a bit of a false perception around Julian because but, he's uh, been injured during, the, during a large part of Celtic being so poor. And I think it's actually enhanced what Celtic fans... Think of him. Expect of him, yeah. But I think I think Julian will be able to play this style of football because he's actually good on the ball. Mm-hmm. As I say, I would I wouldn't want him playing against a you know a Chris Sutton or a Mark Hartley or something. I don't think that's his game. But I think the style that Costa Colo wants to play, I think Chris Julian uh, would do well. But encountering that, you know, and I, I know I know he's away, but if, if I was you know Steven Gerrard or an SPL manager, I'd be putting a big target man up against him because that, that that is where he struggles with a physical battle. Rory, what was your overall thoughts on Celtic? Do you think the addition of Gia Kamakis will help up front with, with goals? Obviously, top goal scorer in the, the Dutch league last season with a team that I think get relegated. So it shows you that he's he's very, very good at scoring kind of poachers' goals. So is that going to be a big addition to Celtic, Jim? He can be top scorer on the SPL this year with a team that gets relegated, to be fair, you know. <laughs> I, I think, I'd, listen, he, They've got a spade of attacking talent. That there's no doubt that's not where Celtic's problems and issues lie. So before Jack and Marcus come in, scoring goals wasn't the issue. If he can add to more goals, then then great. But he's not going to stop them going in at the other end. And ultimately, that's where Celtic's failures have been over recent times. So I think they've been a lot more consistent recently, and they're picking up results and they're they're getting that kind of winning mentality back. The result at Aberdeen was huge. Um, I thought that. I thought a draw would have been fair that day. However, they found a way to win. They went to Motherwell and won relatively comfortably, although Motherwell maybe should have a penalty at 2-0. I still think Celtic going to win the game, even if they get that penalty. Um, so I just think that winning belief is, is, is kind of started to instill back in the squad. I do think that what helps is Postacoglu's persona and how he is. He's very likeable. I think that always helps. I know it sounds like a small thing, but I think everybody wants him to do well. I think all the players will want him to do well. I think the fans will want him to do well. And I think when you've got that, there's almost an element sometimes you can people kind of look at you and not, not want you to fail, but if they don't want you to be there or you feel you're not the best man for the job, I don't think there's anyone looking, even during the kind of darker periods of you know, four, three, four weeks ago, ah, you'll get people complaining and you know venting frustration. But I think everyone wants him to do well. And I think that, over time, um, he will be a good addition. And I've always said, and me and Wilson have you know, discussed it many a time, Wilson thinks Rangers will win by, by double figures. I don't think it will be come the end of the season. So that'll, that'll be a very interesting one to watch out for, to see how it pans out. But to answer your question about Giamakis, aye, brilliant. If he adds another 10 goals, 15 goals to this season for Celtic, that's fine. But I still think that if you were to take those 10, 15 goals away coming off the bench or whatever else, they could potentially quite, you know, could have the same amount of points, if that makes sense. Because I think Furuhashi, Jota, a bad, I think all these guys, Rogic, Turnbull, they get goals, goals all over the pitch. What they don't have is enough clean sheets. So I think until they get somebody in, like Wilson says, where they go, right, I'm going to come in and I'm going to make sure we get clean sheets, I, I still think they're susceptible to, to drop points. We'll move on to the, the, the final game that took place on Saturday. Ross County 2, Livingston 3. It was a thrilling game. Livingston scoring the last minute winner. Wilson, are Livingston beginning to turn their corner? There was a couple of good results in the past few weeks. They certainly have. Um, turn the corner? No, I don't. I don't think so. I think I, I t- those two to be eleventh and twelfth. Um, and albeit an entertaining game yesterday, I still don't think either of them have enough. You know, to get themselves up to, you know, an Aberdeen or a Motherwell or, or whatever, or St Johnston even. Um, it's a great win for them on the road. I think Malky McKay is now under massive pressure. Um, Huge game on Wednesday. Huge mass, game. Uh, is, is that a weight Dundee? Uh, yeah. Are you, are you at that game? Yep. There you go. Um, 
I might tune in then. I might tune in because the Kelly game's on Tuesday, so I might tune in. Um, I massive game, and as I say, I know obviously at the start, and you'll enjoy this, that I tipped Robbie Nielsen to win the sack race, um, sitting comfortably at the top of the league. Um, I think Malky Mackay would be very lucky if he's still there by uh, bonfire night. I don't think, though, that he, they've played they, they've played some nice stuff. Like that. You saw their goals, their Man, two goals were good. Their, chair, their, chairman is, their chairman does not mess around, though. I he's know, not happy, uh, then that's it. They yeah. are conceding a lot of soft goals as well. As, as, as we so say, I mean, it's, C- C- Celtic play some really nice stuff, but they still don't win a lot of games. You know, they weren't winning a lot of games previously. And it's unfortunately, if people, and as we've discussed this a million times in the show, if Celtic fans see Posta Coglu, for example, as a, you know, a long term project, are they going to give this guy three, four seasons to get it right? I don't think so. And Ross County fans certainly are not going to do that. And as Laurie says, Roy McGregor at Ross County ain't, go, ain't going to do that. And the folk coming in, I always think, see if, see if if I was a manager and I'm going to an interview for a job and you do your PowerPoint or your presentation, whatever, and you tell these guys, I see in five years' time, we'll be some team. I still must be going, you think I'm going to be putting X amount of money in for the next five years till you, till you sort this out? You surely want something then that will say, and as a wee bit like John Hughes last year, I'll keep you up. It might not be pretty, we'll win battles, but I'll keep you up, and then it's up to you what to do. And Roy McGregor says, well, okay, we'll do, we'll do that then. As I say, I saw kind of disagreement on the Sky Sports panel uh, today after the game. Like, um, they were talking about, um, should Solskjaer bring in another coach? There was about 15 coaches in that dugout. It, it all Trafford is, as I say, I just don't think Malky Mackay is going to get any more for these players. I, I don't, I, I, the boy Cook seems to be a decent player, but if you're getting beat at home from Livingston um, and you're having to, you know, you're looking to go to Dundee to win, as I say, I think he's in a very, very shaky peg. What's your thoughts on the, the game yesterday, Rory Ross County 2, Livingston 3? Big one for Livingston? Big one for Livingston, I, um, for sure. I think Livingston actually might be okay. It's David Martindale seems to think so, certainly. Um, in terms of Ross County, I mean, their captain Baldwin, I, I mean, last week, the goal they conceded, the, the, the punt up the pitch, um, when they played St Martin, the whole idea of you know you see centre half backs doing it every so often, you know ducking out the way it runs through the keeper, ducks out the way, plays a striker in a goal. Ninety second minute, you need to stand up and be counted at two each. Gets bullied, guy flicks it in the corner. Fantastic header, right enough. But I, I just think you know I, I would consider the term cut adrift at the bottom to be when you need more than one win to climb a place in the table. Now they're now cut adrift. They are four, more than three points behind the team above them and they're sitting rock bottom. If they go to Dens Park on Wednesday night and lose, and Wilson brings up an interesting point about, about John Hughes, who's openly said, you know, I, I thought I had a good chance of getting the job. So he obviously wanted the job. Yeah. It's going to be interesting come January. I might, you know, might have a bit of egg in his face, Royal McGregor chatting John John Hughes's door and saying, look, can you keep us up again and see this time? Maybe give you a wee 18-month contract or... You know, I'll give you a two and a half year deal to come in, keep us up, and then you can do your own thing. Because um, I, 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 I do disagree with Wilson slightly in terms of, I, I think you've got to have more ambition than just, I'll keep you in the league. I think that's fine to an extent, but I do think at some point, as a football club, for the fan base, for everybody, you've got to show signs of improvement. You've got to show tra- signs of, if you are going to take a gamble at some point, you, what you need to do is consolidate yourself in the league first. Before you do that, John Hughes is brilliant type to do that. And then, you know, if things are going well under him, then fine. Obviously, he's won a Scottish Cup with Inverness, unfortunately. Um, but <laughs> but you look at his, you look at his what he does. He comes in and he keeps teams up. And I think that John Hughes is more than capable of consolidating Ross County in that league over the next however long. So look, he's Malky McKay's in the job. No one ever wants to see anyone sacked or lose their job. So you know, hopefully he can turn it round. But I just think that I mean, it's ten games in and. See if he loses on Wednesday. I, I just, I just don't know. I just don't know where he goes from there. Um, I really don't. It's a huge game on Wednesday night. It really is, and they need to win it. Yeah, we'll touch in the game, the midweek games later on in the show, but we'll go to the final game to the, today's game. St. Mirren won Rangers two. St. Mirren took the lead by a wonderful goal from Connor Ronan. Rangers get back into the game through a penalty. Kamar Roof and then Alfredo Morello scored his one hundredth goal for Rangers to give them the two one victory. Rory, we've spoke a lot on this show over the past few weeks about Rangers grinding out results. Ah, you get you get wins, but it comes a point where it's not pleasant to watch and it's heart heart wrenching stuff for Rangers fans to be watching that. 
do you think that win could potentially kind of build them towards kind of getting a, getting into a different gear, which we think they're capable of going to? No, I don't think the result does. No, I mean they've scraped the results for the last two or three weeks, and the same questions have been posed. So I don't, I don't think that that result today specifically means that they could. I wouldn't go as far as it's heart wrenching for Rangers fans. They're sitting top of the league, and you know they've they've lost one game all season. So you know it's still heart and good stuff. I think was what I was trying to say. Like, aye, aye, sorry, right in terms of the, how close the game is, but yeah. look, I, 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 I mean they can see that goal, which is a wonder goal. You it's can a see great that goal, yeah. any, anybody, any time, but. I think at some point it's going to catch up with them if they keep playing like that. Um, yes. I think it's going to catch up with them and they're going to drop drop points. I think Celtic are better than they were last season. I think that's plenty to see. Uh, I think they'll accumulate more points than they did last season, although you know, I've not done the exact maths, but someday will probably point out the fact that actually this time last year they had so-and-so points. I believe that over the course of the season they'll accumulate substantially more points than they got last year. And I don't think Rangers will get anywhere near the other total that they got last year. Um, based on early season form and just little little bits and pieces that you see, um, and the worrying thing from you know from Rangers fans' points of view probably is that you know, they change the system, same personnel, you can't really put your finger on what's going on there. Um, didn't notice Jermaine Defoe was was in the studio down south today um, yeah, during the game, which I found found that quite strange to be honest. Not that that suggests anything at all. I'm just pointing out that you would fully expect one of your first team mainstay coaches who's still technically a player to to be yeah. at a match day um, but look I I think as I think as long as Rangers keep winning but like I've always said there's a certain point in the season where you want performances and a certain point in the season you want results I think this is April time Rangers fans accept today they accept the the 1-0 scrappy win at Dens Park they accept the um, you know scraping by because that's what they need to do at that point in the season I think you're looking for far more at this point in the season you need to see signs that they're going to go on and beat Bromby and Bromby and they're going to, you know, do enough to get the points they need to qualify in Europe to to then kick on and, you know, put in some good performances in the league. And I, I just don't know if they're doing enough at the moment. But they're winning games. But I think we need, you know, it's nice to see our top two teams in the country um, going on and putting on performances and, and, and playing well because it's not nice in the eye for Rangers at the moment. Whereas Celtic, you look across the city and you think, you know, put, put it this way, if I had to go and pay money to watch a team at the moment, I would be paying entry into Parkhead, no Ibrox. Wilson, what, what changed the game for Rangers today? What got them the three points? Well, I, th- I think St Murn are awful, to be honest. Um, I think when you go 1-0 up and you try and sit in for 87 and a half minutes against See, the fair, I thought St Murn played really well in the first 30 minutes. I thought they, they, were, taking it, they were taking the game. I, th- I, th- I, think, I, think, I think they... They, they went for it because as Rory says Rangers haven't been playing particularly <laughs> well um, recently but again still getting the results I just wonder if the Rangers players were a bit panicky that Stephen Gerrard would accept the Newcastle job you know so guy, the, the richest guy in the world you know is buying Newcastle and the first guy who looks at Stephen Gerrard who's won one trophy from 12 in a two horse race you know it's a wee bit maybe it's just kind of befuddled the Rangers players that he might leave uh, befuddled <laughs> No, as I say, I, again, you can you could argue this, you know, all day. Some fans will say one thing, some will say the other. If you say to the Rangers fans, we're going to play very, very poor today and win 2 1, I don't think they care. Nice. You know, I think if possibly there were 25 points ahead and they were grinding out results, you know, then they think, oh, you wouldn't expect to be entertained here a wee bit, you know, start playing the ball. Because Rangers still have the players that can play. What I, what I would say to that, though, is I, on, on one specific occasion, if you were then to go and say, look, it's going to be this way for the next six months and he's only going to play well, but you'll grind out a 1-0, I think you would get fans going, nah, I don't think that's good enough. So on one particular occasion, I, that particular game, but over a longer period of time, I think the Rangers fans would expect more than grinding out scrappy wins every week. I, I appreciate that, but I think if you say to Rangers fans, you know, the wee bit... Keegan at Newcastle, we'll play absolutely brilliant every week, but we'll get beat. We'll be going, no, I win the league. I, I just think it's a, a results thing. You know, I don't, I don't care if, if you win ugly, you know, and it's it's a grind and it's rubbish to watch. If you win the game at the end of the season, you know, you've got the trophy in your hand. Then I'm sorry. I mean, yeah, it's nice to play attractive football, but it's for me, it's all about winning at the end of the day. I'm, 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 and as I say, I think Rangers fans are away happy. Um, winning that game because you know going behind they're still got to be it doesn't matter who you go behind against still got to be that mentality come back and beat them um, 
Rangers obviously have the, the added advantage of the referee on their side um, every week as well. So they're never really going to have to play well and, and win because they'll always get that wee additional help and hand like they got today. But as I say, I, I, I think Rangers will be delighted with that result. I, I say Stephen Gerrard might come out and say he may not be happy with the performance, etc. So this guy didn't do this. But as I say, they, they won the game. They're back top in the league after just that more than a quarter of the season. Um, and, and to be fair, I say sometimes good teams have to go through a phase of grinding out results, you know, just to pick up and keep the pressure on. Rory, you've mentioned in the past on here before about, you know, playing catch up as such, like you know, Celtic winning the Saturday, isn't it? Win the Sunday and vice versa. Um, so it does, it does, it does make it a wee bit, a wee bit more interesting. But as I say, I, I, again, I know the performances differ, but if I look at Rangers' squad in depth, Against Celtic squad in depth, I think Rangers have the stronger squad at the moment. Um, and I, I, yeah, I, I found it very, very strange because, again, it's ifs and buts in hindsight. I wonder what would have happened if it was nil nil, for example. Um, you no know, 70, 75 minutes and Jermaine Defoe's at Old Trafford, you know, and you're thinking if anyone's going to come on off that bench and score a goal for Rangers, it would be Jermaine Defoe. But um, so I, I, did, I did find that strange as well. He wasn't there, but maybe there's something we don't know. Maybe. A reserve yeah, team. Uh, it's you know, I don't think there's anything, you know, naughty about it or anything. I just think it's he's maybe went to Stephen Jersey. I've been invited in here, a man the 18 for Saturday, and Steve just went, no, you can go. Fair, fair play. Would you rather have a, a Jermaine Defoe in that studio the day or Roy Keane? That's all I thought <laughs> when I seen him. I think I think <laughs> uh, I actually I think Roy Keane would have walked out along with the rest of Manchester United fans at three or four nil at half time. It was pain, painful stuff. Yeah. But no, it's, as I say, it keeps it, it keeps Rangers kind of winning the streak going. But I, I I always put the bad or the poorer performances down to how many games they're playing. That that has to catch up with you playing Thursday, Sunday, and then another midweek fixture, and then so is, it, is it a midweek fixture league game, then back to Europa League yeah. the following week? I mean, yeah. it's as I, but it's, it's an awful lot of games for me. I was going to say to you a few weeks ago as well about that kind of mental fatigue that I was talking about. Jang that. As a thing, particularly when you're playing non-stop. Not at this, not at this stage in the season, I don't I know. Think. But they, like, they, 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 they decide to have a break. They've not, they've not much of a break since. Well, what last I will July, say is really? that over the last since uh, since 2004, to, you know, both our both our sides have have went and got to European finals and 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 performed really really well. So and, and, and in effect, they had a six month break during COVID. No, but I know, but since you know, then, but obviously it's been kind of non stop and you've been. Have you, have, I think, I been think that? sports science, and I think I, I, my personal opinion on all this is that, you know, I, I mean, you looked at, I tell you now, see Celtic and Rangers saying that, or any team involved in Europe up here, if you're down to League One in England, you go to the Championship in England, these guys play 46 games yeah. plus cup competitions and all that. Yeah, I think that's it's, true. I, I, you know, these guys are doing it all the time. I spent a few, a couple of years down there. You're playing Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, Johnson's Paint Trophy, Carlin Cup, FA Cup. You're playing games, 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 and you're travelling up and doing everywhere. I played with Carlisle. So I just think it's it's one of these modern day manager um, go to buzzwords, you know, fatiguing. <laughs> uh, I almost, it's, you know, resting players, you know, eight, four games into the season because you've got a, you know, qualifier coming up against. You know, I go back to that Stephen Glass one in Kirkcaldy, and I'm like, well, oh, we've got a game on Thursday against like Sunday. You're eight, you're eight games into the season. Um, what your players can they go through in the League Cup against Wraith Rovers and then turn up uh, five days later and play in Europe? That's, that's nonsense. Um, so I don't buy into that. I think it's sports science has a place in the game for sure, and it's needed in the game, and players need to be protected and looked after. But I think if you look at the historically of the game. These players have played that amount of games for years and years and years. I think it's a modern day myth, is how I would describe it. Yeah. Or a modern day excuse, Rory, maybe. Yeah, well, aye, when it suits them, but hey. Yeah. <laughs> we'll move we'll move away from the premiership. We'll look at the other action that took place over the weekend. The Scottish Cup. There was a lot of big games in the Scottish Cup. Obviously, congratulations to two West of Scotland sides, Auckland Lake and Darvel, reaching the third round with big victories. Wilson, I'll come to you. What was the result that caught your eye in the Scottish Cup? Ah uh, well, I think you've just you've just touched on it there. Both uh, Ayrshire sides going through. Uh, I, I did fancy Auchinleck as much as, despite what I say to Shankers on the chat. Probably uh, still I did, fans, isn't 
Aye, aye. Well, but there is a fan you have to pay in. You have to pay to watch it. <laughs> they play. Uh, I, I did fan shocking. Like to be honest, to be honest, I know Mick will probably be in the phone tomorrow. I, I didn't fancy uh, Darvel at all. I, 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 I told a lot. Did of people you fancy? I, I didn't, and I, and I just always feel. I mean, not that I keep much note of Stranar, but. I just always feel, you know, Stranar's a, a kind of a bigger name as such, and I thought Stranar at home as well. You know, I, I think I think they'll be able to, you know, take care of that because I'll, no disrespect, Darren, but Stranar, I think Muri Egg in your face getting beat from a Western Scotland junior team, as I want to call them, a junior team. But fair, fair play to Darvel and Mac. You know, they've done they've, they've done remarkable well. It's a great result, um, and they've got a tie a tie in the next round that you would be thinking. I mean, if you can beat Stranar, you can beat Breakin. Mm-hmm. You know, so. So fair play, it'll be enjoyable. Um, it'll be enjoyable journey for, for for the guys, and hopefully Scott, you'll be following that journey um, and keep keeping us keeping us all up to date with, with that. But yeah. definitely, the, the Ayrshire side is going through is the big results for me. Definitely, Rory. What was there? Anything that caught your eye in the Scottish Cup? Ah, uh, listen, I don't want to be too repetitive, but I think Darbo, um There's been a lot of talk around the players they've recruited. Um, and the extra lengths they've went to try and make an impact, and you know. Like I said, on their social media, I've seen pictures of their dressing rooms and something you would see in you know, top leagues in Spain and all that. I mean, it looks sensational, the, the way down south and all the rest of it. So I think they've went that extra mile, um, you know, to, to make an impact. And I think beating, beating Stranra, um, who, you know, my hometown, I've fallen relatively closely. Jamie Hamill, a um, friend of mine, is, is is the manager down there. So uh, keep a close eye on them. And I don't think, I think they're in a bit of a pole position in the league. I think they've played better than the, the, the league table suggests. And I, I wasn't sure how that game would go. That's the one I had my eye on in terms of interest. But Darville have managed to grind out a result. And I think if you can go to Stranraer and win, then you can go to Breaking and win. Um, and as Wilson says, you know, the fourth round, you know. That, and these are the moments that you see towards the end of the season as a team where you sit and watch the draw together and, you know, you go to a big ground or whatever else. This is what people underestimate, how, how much these things can build team spirit and the bond and get you through games going into the last stages of the season. So. Um, Aye, hopefully they can do it and hopefully we can get a, a few clubs like that in the next round and we can get some some big ties. Yeah. You're going to be at Clyde Bank versus Elgin tomorrow for BBC. What's your predictions for that one? Yes, a lot to go up and Nicky and all the, all the guys there as well. That's a big achievement for them being on the telly. Aye, I think, um, listen, I, I think it's, a, it's a tough one to call. I really couldn't call it. I think it'll be an, a very closely um, played contest and it's one I'm thoroughly looking forward to. I really enjoyed the, the Berwick Gretna game. Um, so I, I wouldn't like to call it. I think that Clyde Bank have got a good opportunity to go through. I don't see any reason why they can't do it. But Elgin will be keen. You know, these cl- it's massive for these clubs. See if they can get into the third and fourth round and, you know, get these bigger teams. I mean, it can, it can pay their, you know, pay their wages, budgets for their players and staff for years. Um, if they if they get a tie at um, you know Tynecastle, Ibrox, Parkhead, Tanadice, anywhere that draws a, a huge number of fans, so um, I, I wouldn't like to call it tomorrow, uh, but it's a game I'm thoroughly looking forward to. Well, should we be tuning in tomorrow night? Yes, I will do. I I I don't know. I forget the fella's name, and I apologise. But one of the Clyde Bank coaches was giving me a bit of stick on Twitter one day. Um, I forget I forget his name. That's terrible because lots of folk give me stick on Twitter. <laughs> So I'm going to go a comfortable one for Elgin, 2-0. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but best of luck to all the guys at Clyde Bank as well. They're all great guys and we hope they do, they do well tomorrow night. We'll move into the Championship. Just a wee run through the results. A Broth 1, Air 1, Kilmarnock 2, Hamilton 1, Partick 0, Dunfermline 0, Queen of the South 0, Morton 0, Wraith 1, Inverness 1. Wilson, it was a weekend of draws in the Championship, but the only team to win was your beloved Kelly. Three points behind Inverness now. Is that a big one for Kelly beating a fellow relegated team this season? Yeah, I think anyone in that championship. I, I think there'll be a loads more draws to come. I think everyone's capable of beating each other um, in the league. Again, another round of fixtures on Tuesday with the big Ayrshire derby, the yeah. biggest game of the week. Um, confident going down there and putting them to bed as well, like we did at Rugby Park. Uh, but yeah, as I say, I think that the, dif- the difference now in the league was the home game against Inverness that three points where and they beat us 1-0. So, still fairly confident. What I would say, and, that, and this is kind of troubling, now obviously due to my commitments at Stuart, I'm really like, going to the kind of midweek games or Friday night games, but I don't know, back to the social media thing, Tommy Wright's getting an awful lot of stick in social media recently. That, what, what's and, that? Why is that? 
Again, just just as we touched on there uh, with other managers, I think the style of play is not shooting. I think the formation um, is, is incorrect. The Alston and McGinn seem to be the two that's getting the most the most stick uh, in terms of personnel. Um, I know I know it's another point, and I, I don't buy into this at all. But they, they gave they gave the kid Charlie MacArthur his debut um, against Queens Park. He was the boy was excellent, right? Yeah. You know, for a young guy coming in. I know it's not the highest of levels, but he, he come in. He's, he's worked so hard, that kid. Um, he did really, really well, given man of the match. And then he wasn't even stripped for the for the game against Inferno the following Saturday, where we lost two goals that I'd be cracking up if Stuart lost types of goals like that. Um, so, and I know he's a young kid and he's got to be managed, and Norrie will know more about that than me, certainly. Um, and I just think the style of football and the play, there's rumours that Chris Buck's not happy. Um, with his role this season. But again, for me, it's results. And we go back to, I mean, and Shankers gives me dogs abuse for it. We were ruined under Steve Clark, absolutely ruined without the expectation, how high we got. And then obviously, since those days, all we've done is drop from a, from a dizzy height. But now, Tommy Wright's, again, Tommy Wright's probably, and I mean, I'll get his promoted, give me some tools, I'll get his, I'll get his promoted, et cetera. And, you know, second in the league, You've got to be happy with that at this stage of the season. You know, you're not sitting, you know, fourth, fifth, or sixth with five or six teams around you. You're sitting comfortably second, three points off the top. I think the Kelly fan moves need to lay off for a bit. But again, if a negative result on Tuesday night, again, the night the nice will be out again, unfortunately. Rory, did any result in the championship catch your eye? No, no, really. I mean, Kamalik were the only winners for me, literally. Um, I think, you know, you look around the other fixtures, I think a point's much use to anybody in any of those fixtures. Partick Thistle would be expecting and hoping to beat Dunfermline after winning 6 1 the week before. Dunfermline need a win. They've not had a win. Peter Grant needs a win from somewhere. And you look at the other draws around the league, nil nils, one each. I think Kamani, everybody picking up a point and then picking up three, delighted. And I think that's the only result you could look at and go, you know, do you know what? They, they've only got, they've probably the only one with a happy manager come, come the end of the 90 minutes. Yes. It was quite a boring weekend goals-wise in the Championship, but League One certainly delivered. Airdrie 3, Dumbarton 2, Cove 3, Clyde 0, Montrose 4, East 5 1, Peterhead 0, Falkirk 0, and today, Queen's Park 3, Alloa 4. Rory, what caught your eye in League One over the weekend? What caught my eye was Dumbarton going down to eight men and scoring in the 93rd minute. Um, <laughs> that, that, that's my one, one. that's my one. Oh. Uh, um, so I, that was unbelievable. And then obviously going up Going up the the other end and, and scoring. I was obviously coming towards the end of the game at, um, through in Edinburgh and the game had finished and whatever else. And you know, I heard, heard Richard say, Oh, it's, you know, Dumbarton did eight men in my year. And I'm thinking, Oh, wow, eight men? I don't know what is it, one man that's abandoned. Then, yeah. Oh, Dumbarton have just scored. Can you believe it? And then he didn't even finish his sentence. He said, Oh, here they have just scored. So, <laughs> um, so drama, drama, drama in that league. But um, I, th- I think going down, I don't know, I don't know if I've ever, if I've ever heard of that before. I don't know if I've ever known a team to get down to eight men. I've asking down to seven men at Ibrooks. Seven? I know. Oh, there you are. There's a surprise. Aye. Seven now. <laughs> I think it finished seven now, Rangers. I think there was one, I think it was one, if another person gets suspended, I think it was, would be a bad David, David Weir was sent off at Hearts that day. Aye, I think so. Aye. Squally Bruno as well, remember him? Aye, David Weir right there. But <laughs> aye, I'll go with that one. I mean, not the result for Airdrie, you should, you should be beating eight men by more than <laughs> one goal. But um, so, no for the result, but just just for having said that, you know, 4 3 uh, the day is a pretty big one as well. But um, in terms of just overall entertainment value, I would say that game. Well, soon you can catch your eye in League One. I think today's result's a big one. Yeah. Um, I think Barry Fair's going to be under a wee bit of pressure. Um, at Alloa to, to go to Hamden and, and, and wins uh, very good because obviously Queen's Park are probably one of the teams to beat. So, yeah, I'd go with Alloa. I, d- I definitely Montrose as well big one for them 4-1 against East Fife but today I mean Alloa came in uh, 3-2 I think Luther Corner scored in the 90th minute and then Alloa scored two late goals so it's massive for them what is coming up this week there is a full card in the Premiership and Championship so we're just going to go quickly with the, the six games Rory you're going to be in Ross County give us a wee prediction for that um, another difficult one to call I I think Dundee have had such a positive week. Four points out of six. James McPake will be delighted. I think Ross County will be coming down and fighting for their lives. And I think they've got some quality there. 
I will say score draw, one each. Wilson gives a wee quick prediction in that one. Well, I've, I'll go 2-0 Dundee. I, I think Malky will be away, unfortunately. So I'll put Lee Griffiths, will put them to the sword, 2-0. Can I'll I just go. say as well, the boy for Dundee, Luke McCowan, um, on the left-hand side, and Max Anderson. Uh, Max Anderson was excellent on Saturday, and the boy Luke McCowan's really impressed, impressed me over the last couple of weeks. So really good side to watch Dundee. They play some nice stuff, obviously. I'm not just saying that as an ex-player. They're just, they, they are. Um, I've watched boy, McMullen looks good as well, Rory. McMullen. His work rate stands out as well. Aye. He's not just he, good he offensively, defensively as well. Aye, he's good. Um, so they're, they're a good team to watch. Um, and I think they'll be absolutely fine this season. I just think that I just think that Ross County will come down and I, I, they need to get something from the game. And I think that they might just do enough to get something. Yeah, we've also, there's other games in the famous strip. Hibs, Celtic, Levy, the United, Muddle, St. Marin, Rangers, Aberdeen, and St. George and Hearts. What we'll do is We'll get the guys to give the predictions and uh, we'll, we'll send them in and we'll put them up over the before Wednesday and we'll get everybody to kind of join in on a wee prediction thing. But we'll obviously go through just a quick one as well. Wilson, this, we've got a few fan questions. This one's for you, first of all. Ayr versus Kelly, give us a prediction. 2-1, Kelly. Rory, what's yours? Can I, I also, sorry, say... just like before Rory, sorry. Can I just put a, a, a wee mention, like, I think Air have been very good with the ticketing policy, albeit there's been a lot of complaints in terms of they sent out the kind of COVID protocols and you have to be there at quarter past six and they were expecting to get 3,000 Kelly fans through three gates in an hour and a half, which is, I think that's going to cause issues. But in terms of, you know, they've offered concessions tickets, chills tickets for £6 now. My two boys have never experienced an Airshell derby, you know, at Somerset before, so... £6 a ticket and £18 for an adult, I, I, I think it's very good going from them. So it's a well done to them. How they're going to get 3,000 Kelly fans in, though, um, and how many Kelly fans are going to be there for quarter past six, I do not know. I'm a wee bit worried about that in terms of taking the boys, but fair, fair play to Air for, for doing that. Sorry, Rory. Sorry. Um, I don't know. I mean, obviously, Wilson sees more command than I do. So... You know, he concerns over the style of play and how they're grinding out results aren't playing particularly well. I know he had a poor result a couple of weeks ago, a very poor result. But Jim Duffy, I think, will make a huge difference to air. Uh, he knows how to get his results and he knows how to play. So, based on what Wilson said there and the fact that I think Jim Duffy will, will do good things for air, I'll say that air will win by two goals to nil. Get him off. <laughs> get Shankers back on here. <laughs> Meg, it don't make it. I'll go <laughs> I'll go a draw, one each. I think it could be a, a feisty as a dad. I might go with that myself, actually. But we'll we'll move on to talking about... There's a question here for Rory. What is your thoughts on the situation at your current club, at your former club, Falkirk? It's just one disastrous decision after another, really. Behind the scenes, you know, going back years and years and years. Listen, Falkirk have always been a club which its foundation is built on homegrown talent on working with kids and bringing them through. They've got, you know, you come out the tunnel at the Westfield Stadium and, you know, there's rows and rows of youth products and players from Scott Arfield right through to Jay Fulton and Stephen Kingsley. Um, the decision to kind of scrap that um, back in, I don't know when it was now, a few years ago anyway, to then to decide to scrap that, to recruit from England unknown quantities through a scout which was appointed to bring in the so-called best free agents from down south, you know, ultimately led and then being relegated from the league, then going down the route of appointing um, two former players and Lee Miller and David McCracken, things were going fine. They decided to change it after a couple of sticky results. I was at the Fur Hill that night when they were, you know, part won the league. Now, if Falkirk were trying to secure the playoffs for League One, and they were absolutely atrocious, they get beat, beaten by five. They then lost to Montrose. They didn't get in the playoffs, and they find themselves now on the back of, like I said, that this isn't this season. Um, this isn't Paul Sheeran's fault. This isn't, um, you know, I, I just, I just think that going back to that period of time where they got rid of. It's, you know, players who did a lot for the club, again, I'll go back, use the word historically, won leagues years and years ago and fans' favourites and people who were well-respected, who put in a lot of hours away from 
first team training every day, look after the youth teams and put in extra hours training them and helping the kids and stuff. Players who should have left through the front door, left through the back door. That coincided with the scrapping of the, the youth system and the setup. I just think the club lost its identity completely, um, which is a real shame. They completely lost everything that Falkirk was known for and it's never came back. And they need to they need to try and build from scratch, start the foundations again and put in place what they had before because Falkirk was a club that you were proud to be at before and you were proud to be associated with. And over the years, like I said, they've just became another club. They've just became another club who are fighting to get out of League One with no identity, no real structure there. And I just feel like it's time that changes were made at the club to get them back to where they should be. Yeah, it was bad to see the the, the obviously the, the fans forum the other day. It wasn't a, it wasn't a pleasant viewing. But Wilson, I'll come to you as well. What was your thoughts on it? Obviously, you know kind of Gary Holt quite well. Where did you kind of thought think where do you kind of think of the way he's kind of been portrayed lately by the, the fans? Again, it was, it was it was it was a remarkable coincidence. I, I met Gary on the Monday night and I was asking, you know, how things were going, etc. He, he seemed, you know, Gary's always a really, really nice guy to talk to. Yeah. Um and he was, he was a wee bit upbeat saying he had a fans forum thing that the, the following night. And I, and I didn't take I didn't take any any much notice of it. I thought these were kind of commonplace for the chief executive or someone in Gary's role eh, to go and attend. And then I saw some I saw something the Tuesday kind of late night tweet something about OMG, have you seen the full cup? Again, never thought anything of it. And then I saw a bit on YouTube and I listened to the guys <laughs> for the first question or the first statement as the, yeah. the chairman called it. And again, it goes back to Rory's identified what he believes and probably what is the kind of issues surrounding Falkirk. Yeah. If you put people in there to build a project over five years, you can't be sacking them after a year or after six months or after eight months. Now, again, it's the gamble that you give them the full five years um, to get these things up and running. But, but unfortunately, every club and every city and every team needs that financial Input. I mean, I agree with what you're saying about the first team. There's no youth products, but I think there's a lot of clubs that could easily get rid of their youth structure because there doesn't seem to be anything coming through. Now, I know in terms of getting X amount of wards... But Falkirk's did, though, Wilson. Fal Falkirk's yeah, but all absolutely over, I mean, did. I mean, the, 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 last, the last... I mean, again, who, who, would have been, who would have been the last Falkirk player that's come through the ranks and affect into first team football and played so, and then earned, well, earned a I, big move as Jay, such. Jay Fulton, maybe. When I when I was at Falkirk and I walked into that that dressing room that day, there was Will Volks, who mm -hmm. you could potentially consider a, a youth product there, you know, came through the ranks and stuff, although he joined a little bit later on. Um he's played for Cardiff. You've got Jay Fulton who, you know, played regularly in the Premier League, who's at Swansea. You have Stephen Kingsley who's got a number of appearances in the Premier League down south. Craig Sibbald, who's now carving a career for himself in the, the, the top league. Conor McGrandles, who's played for Lincoln in League One, who played in the playoff last year, I think, man of the match. The, you know, the, there's a number of players there um, who have went on and, 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 and had really, really good careers. And that was ultimately you know, cut short or whatever else. So I would have to strongly disagree with you and say that I, don't, I can't speak for other clubs, but... Falkirk's system was working. They had one. And if you go into the Westfield Stadium, you'll see the rows and rows and rows of I'm youth not, products I'm that not, came I'm through. Not it hasn't worked previously. I mean, you mentioned the likes of Arfield and all, all these guys. And, you've, and as I say, you've given, you've given me some names there. But again, who's, who's, who's the last? I mean, I, I'm a great believer. And now there was a, there was a, there was a kid at Kilmarnock, I think he's uh, Liam Smith, I think his name was, that was in the youth set up in Manchester City bottom or I don't know what the fee was, but they, they certainly took him, and I'm quite sure there's add-ons, et cetera, et cetera, if that kid becomes um, a superstar at Man City. Now, I'm quite sure possibly the money that Kelly received for that kid could possibly fund the youth system, et cetera, for X amount of years. I'm a great believer, and these kids from the youth setup should be fed in to the first team of that club. You know, I think the, the, that boy Liam's unique. So what I'm saying to you is that the, the, the team, your team at Kilmarnock, Rory, Cammy Bell, Jamie Hamill, Stephen Naismith, yourself, Jamie Adams, you were Kilmarnock youth players that played first team for Kilmarnock and then went on to carve careers, etc. elsewhere, some at bigger teams, some at lesser teams. 
But what I'm saying is, I don't think every club's youth structure works well enough and the funding out, outweighs the negatives because if there's no one coming through, now that Charlie MacArthur has played, uh, he's came through Achilles youth set up, he's in the Kelly first team squad now we'll say, he's had one appearance in the first team. Is, is it value for money? When clubs are, Falkirk, are so for Falkirk, one million percent. But when clubs when clubs are so tight for money, okay, and they have to make cuts, is it, and I don't, I don't agree with it, but I'm saying if the youth set up isn't feeding the first team, therefore is there is there a need for it just now? I think Falkirk's was. I think it was just a decision they took at the time to, to, to go down a different route. I don't I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of it, so I wouldn't be able to say categorically, but I don't think it would have been a financial decision. I, I might be wrong, but I, I think that, or they maybe wanted to free up some money, but I, I mean, bear in mind, I, I'm naming... I would be amazed if it wasn't a financial decision, because I wouldn't but, feel, but, 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 why would bearing, you do that? Bearing in mind, the the boys, you know, you're asking me to name the latest one, I'm rhyming off names, bear in mind that the, the, the system at Falkirk ceased, has ceased to exist for a number of years now, so, right. you know, it didn't get closed down yesterday, it was it was a, few, a good few years ago, so the boys are naming, you might think, well, that was a while ago, but the youth system was, was, was shut down a while ago as well, so... Um, I listen. I, I don't. I don't disagree with any particular club. I just. You know, I just think Falkirk's lost its way and it's lost its identity a little bit. And I, like I don't. I, I never seen even when I wasn't at Falkirk. I didn't. I always seen them as a club who, you know, I don't know. They they just had a different feel to them in terms of the way they did things and how they like to play football and how they invested so much in their youth. And you could probably rhyme off a, a list as long as your arms in, in terms of the names that they've that they've brought through and. I just don't see what direction they're going in. They need direction. They need, and I, I'll use the word again, identity, I think. Yeah. You could, as I say, you could, you could argue, and I know it's much more difficult um, because the old firm can afford to, you know, go out and buy abroad or take, you know, better players as such. But, you know, you would, you would look at Celtic's youth system, you know, and like I'm thinking is Cal Callum McGregor's one of how many kids? That's it's, apple and or, it's apples and oranges, though, in my opinion. Yeah, because, uh, yeah I know, but see, yeah, you've got the likes of Tony Watt and that still playing Premier, Jamie McCart, they've all went through it. They, they, they're all still Premier League footballers. But to, obviously, it's harder to get any Celtic Rangers first team, you know? And, and as, as I say, I just think the, the youth setup for me should be there to feed into the first team. So it would save, just say, for example, Kelly going to France and signing a 19 year old striker. Kelly were taking. 18-year-old centre has for Bournemouth, 17-year-old centre has for Wolves. And these guys were, were hopeless. And I'm thinking, sure, there must be something in our own new setup, might not be as good, but there must be some sort of progression there from a centre half in our new setup to save a wage from Bournemouth or Wolves coming to play for Commander. Because these guys will need, sometimes they were coming up for there and not playing. They're sitting on the bench. And I think, sure, there must be a youth product sitting on the bench. And as I say, I think Commanders, and I'm guessing here now, Commanders' model has to be for under 18, 16s, whatever, to feed into Commanders' first team, unless they're an exceptional talent like that boy, Liam. That's Problem, I mean, I'm City. going, going all down a rabbit hole a wee bit here in terms of, like, it's a whole other discussion, but, like, we've kind of spoke about it on before, and it's something we've agreed on, is that the gap now, you know, when I played for Commanders, you know, you were playing on a Monday night in a reserve league. When you're playing against the big boys, you were playing in front of two, 3,000 at 16-year-old. And, you know, a manager could sit in the stand and go, He's ready. He's not ready. Is he playing under whatever it is now, under 18s, and then the next steps, the first team or whatever it is? A manager yeah. can't turn. A manager no can't turn. Ah, there's no bridge there. Exactly that. And you know, back back in the day, you know, if you were injured, sorry, if you were in the first team and you were on the bench or you come back from injury, you played in the reserves. It went, you know, that 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 was how it worked. It wasn't like I need to play in the reserves this week or or I've been asked or been told that if you were injured, if you were on the bench for the first team, you played on the Monday. That's how it worked. And if you were one of the... So it was a mixture of the best performing under-19s players and first-team players. And it was the same at your Rangers, your Celtic, your Hibs, your Hearts. If Derek Rodden had been on the bench that week, I pick, I don't know why I plucked him out there, but he would play. If um, whoever it may be, you know, Evander Snow would often play. You know, all these types of guys who were squad players at these big clubs would play. Um, and that gives a gauge to go, do you know what? We can throw... 19-year-old Kilmarnock centre-back in, he's playing in the uh, under-18s and he's playing against, you know, all can crew or whatever it may be in front of anybody and they're playing against Rafe Rovers, Rafe Rovers' development squad. Tommy Wright can't turn around and go, right, he's ready to play against Aaron and Ayrshire Derby. So, you know, that there's a whole host of reasons as to why 
they may be bringing players up for roles in different places, but I, I don't believe it to be a, anything to do with the standard up here or the youth setups or the system. I just think that the bridge, you know, bridging the gap is, is, is too much and there needs to be another level of football in there. I would just go back to reserve team football when I would make it like it was before, but again, I suppose it's kind of like that, get to that age on my day and all that, but um, and everyone believes that it worked well, but I, I genuinely believe that it worked far better then than it does now. I really do. Um, so that's just again, you know, BP cut back in the day, Wilson. You know, I mean, how the crowd when they played Rangers in the final that day, I must have been thousands and thousands and thousands. Imagine command that getting to a final and playing Rangers now in the BP Cup, a few hundred there or a couple of hundred. Right all can <laughs> <laughs> do, you know, do you know what I mean, though? Yeah, just, so I, 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 I'm 100% agree with you. 100%. It's, to, it's totally, to, totally lost its competitiveness and you know I, I think that you need to be involved in that environment if a manager's going to have faith to throw you in yeah and I, and I always say like what one of my mates I always say to him who, who was the best player you ever played against and he said Trevor Stephen and I'm like Trevor Stephen how on earth did you play against Rangers Everton Marseille Trevor Stephen he said a reserve game at Troon and he's playing it as you say playing against Trevor Stephen and you think there you go. You're telling me the other team football doesn't work. What he learned from Trevor Stephen that 45 minutes run around probably set him up for the rest of his career. You Paul know? Lambert. Paul Lambert played against him at Rugby Park one night um, at 16, 17 year old to play against him. Boys at 16 and 17. That's no offence to these boys at 16 and 17 now. They're, they're not given the platform the opportunity to do that because again, yeah. Paul, Paul Lambert wouldn't have played on the Saturday so he plays on the Monday. That's how it works. Was, was, that, was that the game at Rugby Park the reserve game? They were killing out 3 0 up at half time. Oh, I don't remember. Or the score. I probably and scored a hat trick, but I can't remember. I remember <laughs> Martin O'Neill coming down. Martin O'Neill coming down in the dugout, giving uh, John Robertson uh, the, the kind of waggy finger, and then Celtic came out the second half and won like four three or three two, whatever it was. It was like, uh, oh my goodness! Possibly. <laughs> I just, I just always stick to me that I played against him. But that's the type of experience you would go through. And if you can go in and you can play well, Jim Jeffries is looking at that, going, "Ah, he's got a wee bit." You know, yeah. last last ten minutes on Saturday, why not? No, never transpired. I ended up moving on, but that, that's how you get your opportunity. Just don't Definitely. think that the, I just don't think the platform is there for young boys to to go on and and prove it. They need to go, you know. And I, I think the boys at 18, 19 now are falling at the game because they're kind of scum up with it and they're fed up with it and they go and get a job or you know. I I, I just feel that there needs to be a bit of a shake up at, at, at that level when boys reach that age. Yeah, definitely. I can uh, agree more. It's probably a, we could probably do a, show, a full show on the make it like in a right, situation. Sorry, but we're, a tangent now. <laughs> we're going to we're going to wrap up there. Obviously, we've got a a big week ahead on the channel. We kick start our road to Cheltenham show. Myself and Callum will be back on Wednesday with that show. We're going to have two Scottish football extra shows with the guys from Rossville and Borden. Your old coach Alan Robertson's going to be on the show. Rory again to say anything you want to give us later on. No. Good, good take. Like I said, you was involved in a lot of these experiences that yeah. I'm talking about. You know, back then you'd play, you'd play on a Saturday with the the under 19s. Uh, you would win. You would be cleaning your boots and you'd be building the goals for the first team when they're training and all the rest of it. If they were training on a Saturday or they were playing on a Saturday, you would, you know, you could do a play an under 19s game. You would then report to the first team game and do the kit and do all the different things after. Pump the balls up, de-pump the balls, do everything you needed to do. Deflate, sorry. Um, clean the stadium after they'd left. Um, walk around to Grand Jones house, get a wee kip, and then you, you know on on the Sunday you would be potentially in again for a bit of training. Monday, if you'd played perform well on the Saturday, you were working um, and you were playing with the reserves on a Monday night, um, and that's how it worked. It was a job, you know. In between playing football, it was a job, and Alan Robertson was a great guy to work under, and um, you know it, it was almost because it was a job and you were here all the time. You, you know they become coaches at that point when you're so young. They become more than a coach, so. Aye, he was he was great, and um, you know some really um, unbelievable experiences. And you know it's probably two of my favourite years of my whole career, if I'm being honest. The, the laughs you had back then as well, and the stuff you got up to, and how it worked, and being in and around Kamalika, I absolutely loved my time there. I must say, brilliant. But we're going to finish up the show there. It's been an absolute pleasure to have Wilson and Rory back as always. Thanks very much for coming on. Thanks, Scott. Much brilliant. appreciated. Thanks very much, to everyone that's tuned in. Please follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube and podcast channels. And we'll see you soon. Cheers.